Hey everybody, I'm Ashley Graham, and this is Pretty Big Deal, where confidence is key. Every episode, I get to pick the brains of brilliant, inspiring, honest, new and old friends who are a pretty big deal. Today, we are talking to accomplished magazine editor, television personality, and best-selling author, Elaine Welteroth. Elaine's in the house. Hey. You look beautiful. Thank you. I know you've been traveling so much. Look but who's like, talking. Well, thank you. The most gorgeous pregnant woman I've ever seen. You oh really gosh. are. And you don't even, like, it's just a belly. It's like Ashley Graham bouncing all over the world, like big personality, <laughs> like doing her thing, like still working out, like still doing shoots every day. And then like, oh, by the way, I have this cute little belly. First of all, thanks for saying it's little because it's not, but I will take your compliment. It doesn't look like that, sis. Thank you. No, you, it Thank looks like you. this belly has not slowed you down at all. I haven't allowed it to. First trimester is funny. It does mm. slow you down. And it was a Jesus thing because I didn't work my whole first trimester. It Good was like summertime. And I was vacationing and chilling out. That's what your body needs. It was really your good. baby deserves that. Yes, it does. Baby Graham. There's so many things that I want to like go off of pregnancy. Like I want to talk about marriage uh, because you're getting married soon. But we will talk about that later because okay. I really kind of want to dive into it. Okay. But also babies. It's an interesting conversation that I've been having with my husband, obviously, because we're having a child together. Mm. But in your book, you talk about having a white father, mm. a black mother, yeah. and how it was a conversation that they had in their approach in shaping you as a black woman yeah. and your brother as a black man, right? You have a brother, yeah. yes. and your brother. They wanted to help avoid a racial identity crisis for us down the line. Got it. So my mom is an African-American woman. My dad is this like German, Irish, like hippie California guy. Uh -huh. And they decided before we were born that we were going to be black. Right. Because that is the way that the world would see us. That would be the experience that we would have in this country. And they just thought, like, let's eliminate confusion about things. Let's just make it easy and clear. And the reality is they did that with the best of intentions. And in a lot of ways, I understand why that's necessary. And to just, like, hit it off at the pass and have those conversations out in the open and to instill a sense of cultural pride in your child and all of the identities that they possess, but particularly to make sure that they're clear on how they're going to be seen in the world. It's a parent's duty to help start that process of feeling a sense of pride in your culture and your identity. Yeah. And so that's what my parents did. But ultimately, it's still a confusing process and you can't, like, you can't prevent the, the identity crisis because it's inevitable. I'm curious, I'm the white person in an interracial relationship and I'm about to have a black baby and, or a biracial baby. And this is a conversation that Justin and I have been having. So I just think it's really Well, biracial is not an identity yet, okay. unfortunately. Like we don't hold space in our language even for biraciality. That's interesting. Do you call President Obama the first biracial president of no, America? No, he's black, Do you call right? Halle Berry the first biracial woman to win an Oscar? Yeah. Do, no. no, no, I'm saying Do, I'm agreeing with you. No, 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 I know you are. I'm just, I'm just pointing <laughs> out because it's, it's a nuance that we just don't often think about. Mm. So like Misty Copeland, I mean, a lot of the first in black history are actually biracial people, but we don't really have the language for it. The first biracial celebrity that I saw identified as biracial was Meghan Markle. Oh, and yeah. that's like couple years ago, you know? So I think that's an important thing. I hope that that changes and that over time we can create space for all types of identities to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that your phenotype, the way you present. And to the world. That is black. what, that is going to dictate your experience. I think that your conversation, you guys can have all the kind of premeditated conversations ready to go for your child. But ultimately a lot of your child's experience is going to be dictated by their appearance, mm -hmm. the color of their skin, the texture of their hair, mm -hmm. and you're there to help insulate some of the blows that are inevitable in the world. And for me, my brother, I remember like being so confused. Like I, I remember being in preschool and being one of the only brown kids in, in the class. We were asked to do an assignment where we had to make a collage of our families. So everyone's like looking through magazines and I'm flipping through my magazines and then Everyone's like starting and I'm like, wait, but I don't see anybody who looks like my mom wow. or me or my brother in these magazines. I got a lot of white dad options, but where are the like black people? And I didn't actually know I was black. I didn't know my mom was black. I just knew I couldn't see anyone who looked like my mom. And this is my very first memory in life. And so it was the first time I was like, oh, I'm different. 
oh, Don't is something me. wrong with me? Wait, hold on. Why can't I see myself in these magazines? And this is before you have language for these things. We didn't talk about representation at three years old. No. You know, like, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay. I, I just looked around and I was like, okay, I guess I'm just going to do what everyone else is doing. I'm going to cut out white people. <laughs> I started cutting out white people. And I like made a full collage of a full white family. And the, imagine how awkward that is for the teachers who are like, what is going on over there? So I remember a teacher coming over and trying to like steer me towards the sole black girl in one of these magazines. And I just ignored her because I did not want to be different. Oh my God. And then I came home with that white paper family and my proud black mother took one look at that and said, oh, Houston, we have a problem. You and your brother need to sit down at that table and we're going to redo that assignment together. And she whipped out Ebony and Essence magazines and we redid that collage. And that was my first memory in life. And it was a race conversation, you know? We, yeah. had, we had to have that conversation. Yeah. And I remember my mom put that revised family collage on my wall. And it was the first thing I saw every morning, the last thing I saw every night for years. Mm -hmm. So that no matter what I saw on commercials or in the pages of magazines, I could see myself and my family reflected mm -hmm. as we are. Mm -hmm. And it was a reminder to be proud of that. Um, wow. I think we're living in a world that's becoming a lot more blended. We're having a yes. lot, a lot more conversations, conversations. about race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, and, and so hopefully your child will have so many more examples mm -hmm. of what a blended family looks like, mm -hmm. or what an interracial family looks like, and it won't be such an anomaly. Yeah, I only have Mariah Carey. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, that's all I had. That's insane. Yeah, but also it does ring true, just in the fact that so many, as you said, there's just a lot of blended families now. Mixed race, multiracial people are the fastest growing population, and yet I feel like our stories and the exploration of that identity is so under discussed. Hmm. What about you? You're about to become a mom and you're doing it with a black man. Like what are the conversations that you and Justin are having about this? The conversation that Justin and I have been having is that, you know, he wants to raise his children black because like your parents told you, the world will treat you the way that they see you. Yes. And as a white woman, I have had to understand what that means. Mm -hmm. And I think that I've had to understand a lot of things. I, like, I didn't know what white privilege was walking into this relationship. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand half the things that I've learned in the last 10 years of being with Justin. Mm -hmm. And I think that when you're the white person in an interracial relationship, you should be asking questions. You should be getting filled with information. It's the white person's job to really get to know the other culture because mm -hmm. we live in a white world. Mm -hmm. You touched on something that I think is so important for folks who've never understood or never had to be in a situation where they are the only one who looks like them. Yeah. I think it is crucial. It is vital to put yourself in positions where you have to feel that otherness. You have to go out of your way to put yourself in that position in a world that centers you, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a brave thing for you to do, to take on that responsibility I, and to own it and to welcome it. And I'm sure it may, it's uncomfortable at times. There's uncomfortable moments, but I don't even want to call it brave. I want to call it just something that I want. Like, yeah. I love Justin that much that I want to know everything about him. Yeah. Like, to the core of who he is. And he is a black man and he's proud of it. Mm -hmm. So I want to understand like, what does all of that mean? Yeah. And how can I be of assistance mm -hmm. <laughs> when raising children? Yeah. So yeah, you're asking all the right questions and you're doing all the work that you, that you can do. No parent ever gets it perfectly. No, they don't. You know? They don't. But we can try. But you can, yeah. We can try. You're going to be a great mama. <laughs> Thank you. You're going to be a great mama. I'm how do so you feel like all of this shaped your identity in general? It's like such an inextricable part of my experience that I don't really know what it would be like to not have that. You know, like my dad is my dad and my mom is my mom. So you can't really dictate like how it's all gonna come out, you know, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Like, I feel like it was a huge blessing in a lot of ways. There's a lot of strengths and positives that come out of having access to two different cultures and two completely different worldviews mm -hmm. in your household. Yeah, I agree. You know, because you, have an empathy for people who think differently than you do. You can understand both sides of things. And um, I think I grew up feeling like a little bit of a bridge in divides. Mm. First racially at home and culturally, but then also over time, I kind of, I asserted that, or I felt that that was part of my role in 
my profession and my friend groups and in the world. That you like set I, a bridge. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've been able to become a bridge and divides between mm -hmm. races, between old and new media, you know, between fashion and politics. It's helped me like moderate, you know, two different sides. And I think at a time like this where we're, there's such a, so many deep, deep divides in our country, it's actually been a benefit being biracial and having that kind of like home training well, who knew that bridge would be so strong because <clears throat> you've had so many amazing career moves in your life, mm -hmm. big things that have happened. But I mean, you started in college and mm -hmm. you went in for journalism. Is that why you went in? Well, first I studied psychology and okay. then I was like, nobody cares about my outfits in <laughs> these classes. So, um, and then I was like a little, I was always interested in fashion, but I was too intimidated by like capital F fashion okay. coming from a small town. So I was like, okay, I love to write and I love getting in people's business. I love like interviewing people. Yes, I know. So I know it's like taking everything from me to not interview you right now. I know, to right? To not like switch it up. I know. But and it, this is always so, because you're, we're like switch. I know. And I've had to like use another part of my brain yes. in order to interview people because I, you know, it's easy to get interviewed. Well, for you. I know. It's and you're probably saying it's easy to interview. Yes. <laughs> I am much more comfortable being the interviewer. We are like sitting in that chair. What have you learned? Like how, how has that shift been for you? Well, what I've learned is that there's so many annoying questions that people ask mm. that I don't ever want to ask people because I've been asked them. Yeah. But I also understand why people ask the same questions and, because you have a new audience. Yeah. You know, this is why you do a circuit for your book. This is, you know, th there's just so many different things like that. But what I have realized is that because I'm the one in control, I can really get to know you the way I want to get to know you. Ooh. And I think that the viewer also just appreciates that because, you know, it's coming from a different perspective than maybe a different podcast or yeah. show. So yeah. I like to take from everybody. I mean, I did my research. Oh, yes. And so yes. I was like, what Oprah. else do I need to know? What else do I need to know? So that's yes. why I started off with how you were raised. But yeah. so you went into journalism and boom, you come out and you talk about this story a lot. Right out of college, you get an opportunity to work with Ebony. But yeah. the real love and want was Essence. Yes. <laughs> Until you did uh, your research. I did. Harriet Cole comes into your life mm -hmm. and she invites you to set as an intern. This mm -hmm. is your first day on set. You have no idea what's going on. You have no idea where you're going. Mm -hmm. And you show up in Malibu mm -hmm. and there's Serena Williams yes. and they're shooting a cover. Yes. Okay, first of all, whoa. Second of all, what is life? you yes. say, oh, I think she should be in the blue bikini. Yes. And it ends up on the cover. Like, what? So do like, you, what? Do I really you, was like, I'm done. I've made it. This is like that. This is the best it's going to get in my life. So I should just stop here. Yeah. Do you feel like your ignorance in walking into that set was actually bliss? Uh, it helped you? It's totally. Because like now looking back, I'm like, what kind of audacity did uh, I have as an intern? Like I should have been in the corner, waiting, you know, speak when spoken to. <laughs> And here I am, like, sharing my opinion. But I will say this. Like, I, I was still very conscientious of my placement in that ecosystem. And I was trying to walk this fine line between, like, wanting to impress her in order to prove value and hopefully get a job offer mm -hmm. while also not overstepping. And, um, and, you know, if you only have one shot, you'll have one day to make an impression. Are you really going to waste it in the corner being quiet? And as Not someone, Elaine. Well, not young and Leon. That she was a different, a different breed. But I remember being at other internships and feeling like I was dying by the second. Like I just remember thinking, like I hate this so much. I don't, I don't want to wake up every day of my adult life dreading going to work. This set is where I feel like I belong. Like I felt so alive, and I felt so like. I know exactly what to do. I'm, I, I want to do this. And so I felt really driven mm -hmm. to try to make an impression. And I was, and I waited for my moment. You know what I mean? I waited for my moment. I, I, I really like took my time and- It probably jumped. helped that you knew the hairdresser, right? It helped that I knew the hairdresser who did my hair for prom. Like this was an omen. This was an omen. For prom? She did my hair for prom both years. And she was trained in my Aunt Janet's hair salon back home and just so happened to now be a hair, a celebrity hairstylist on set wow. of my first, like it was like one of those kismet things yeah. where I was like, this is a sign I'm meant to be here. So I'm just gonna be a little bit bolder than usual. And it paid off. And I whispered the, the suggestion by the oh, way. Oh really? I whispered it. Like I wasn't like being crazy. Well, you did a good enough job that Harriet Cole actually offered you the position that day. She did. And wild. you took it. 
But I, I want to know, because you're working at Ebony then and not Essence, and I mm. want to talk about choosing that opportunity over the sexy. You yeah. say exactly, choosing hard work over sexy. Yeah, I always say don't chase the sexy because, <clears throat> listen, I think you, at the end of the day, you are the one who has to come home to yourself. Mm. And you are the one that has to get up every day and go back to the work. And the work has to be fulfilling enough. You can't do it for the hope of impressing other people or like getting accolades. It's gotta be intrinsically satisfying. So I thought at that time, like my greatest goal, my biggest goal in life was to work for Essence Magazine because that's the magazine that raised me. That's the magazine that saved me from yeah. an identity crisis. Right. You know, I loved that magazine growing up. It was the only place that I saw like just, just beautiful black women who were well-rounded and successful and stylish and mothers and wives and executives. Like that's the kind of woman I wanted to be. So I really wanted to work at Essence, but this opportunity came to work with a woman who was the essence of that Essence woman. Mm -hmm. And she also started her career at Essence and she there was a lot that I could learn from her day to day. And so I decided to not chase the sexy, the sexier brand at the time, which was Essence. Um, Ebony's kind of like your old, your like auntie and uncle's magazine. Right. I know a lot of people may not know the difference really, but because they're both black magazines, but it was a different audience. Well, it's also um, a little bit more media. Essence is the fashion and beauty Bible for black women. Mm -hmm. Whereas Ebony is like, you're like the family's like news kind of source. Got and it. it includes fashion and beauty, but it's more on the side. So anyway, all of that to say, I, I was inspired by this woman and I wanted to learn from her. And I basically would have followed her to the end of the earth. It just so happened she happened to be working at Ebony and that's where the opportunity was. And I was like, you know what? At Essence, I'm gonna be one of a ton of interns. Mm. It probably stuffed away in some corner, like probably wouldn't have gotten that much real experience, hands-on right. experience. Whereas at Ebony, I was one of one. And I knew that I would have the opportunity to work side by side with her. Work your way up. I mean, no intern gets that opportunity to work with Serena Williams on a cover shoot set on their first day. First you know day. I mean? So that alone was enough to tell me like this experience is gonna blow my mind. Yeah. Um, and yes, other people might not get it. Other people might not think it's sexy. But you were leading with your mind and not your heart. And I think that that was the most important thing. Because I think that a lot of people go off of emotion and not off of like, what is the right thing to do? Yeah. And you did the right thing. I followed my enthusiasm. Mm. And I that's the thing I always try to check in with myself on. And folks ask me for advice. I'm like, follow your enthusiasm because I think your mind can play tricks on you. Mm. I think your heart can change. Mm. And people say, trust your gut. I'm like, what does that feel like? What does that feel like exactly? <laughs> I do say you know, trust your gut a lot. I am a gut girl. But how does your gut, like, show up for you? Like, what does it actually feel like? Because for it's just, me, I just know what excitement I, feels like. I feel a pit in my stomach when it's wrong. Like, I feel ah. kind of like, not hungry, but empty. Ooh. And then it's like, oh, that's not good. That's my gut talking to me. Does your gut tell you when something is good too? I kind of have an instinct excitement when it's good. Yeah. And then it's like, I go through like a mental breakdown of like why this is good. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. I love that. You know what I mean? Okay, we have similar processes. Yeah. For me, it's like enthusiasm and excitement is an unmistakable feeling. Right. Whereas like voices in your head and your no, gut, no. I'm like, I think no. I might be bloated. I don't really know what that is, you know? Yes. So, but that's the way I make all my decisions now. Yeah. Okay, girl, hold that thought. If you know me, you know I'm all about that self care. And one of my new favorite self-care routines is all about scents. Vitruvi is a family company committed to creating chic essential oil products that help women take care of themselves so they can take care of the world. Vitruvi aromas are made from 100% pure plant-based essential oils, making this safe for you and your family to breathe in on a daily basis. And it can help you set the mood, whether you need a moment of calm, a deep sleep or a boost of energy. Head to vitruvi.com slash pretty big deal for a look at special offers and get 20% off with code PBD. All right, now back to pretty big deal. Well, so how long were you at Ebony before you asked for the raise? Because oh, getting God. back to a gut feeling, you made a very Oof. ballsy move here. Who was that girl? I don't know who that girl was. Well, you need to talk to us about this because you didn't show up. You asked for a raise. You were making $10 an hour, mm -hmm. you asked for $20 an hour. Yes. They were gonna give you $12 an hour. Mm -hmm. So Elaine didn't show up to work the next day. What? 
Okay, you're making me sound real crazy <laughs> and real millennial right now. Well, you are and I'm not a millennial. saying I wasn't crazy and millennial, <laughs> but there's I guess, you know, some nuances to this. Okay, so so it, it was the beginning of the recession, right? So okay. people were losing their jobs left and right, and here I was without a safety net in my first internship, wanted it so badly. So it, there was some trickery going on here. I would not rec I do not recommend this as career <laughs> advice. I am just telling you what I did, okay? And somehow by the grace of God, it worked. But so this is so crazy. I'm like actually embarrassed to tell the story. <sighs> okay, so I got the internship, right? And it was supposed to be a summer internship that ends at the end of August, August 31st, right. supposed to be over. Okay. But no one told me to leave. So I just kept coming in. So September comes around, October rolls around, November rolls around, no one has told me to leave. Okay. And the paychecks keep coming in. So I just keep coming in. I'm just doing the job I feel like I was born to do. Okay, you know so what I mean? you're going the extra it. mile. I'm just seizing the opportunity. And then one day, speaking of seizing the opportunity, I go, you know, I'm basically a production assistant. So I should just change my title to production assistant. And I did. So literally, my, I changed my signature, my email signature to production assistant from intern. Without consulting anyone. I didn't think to consult anyone about that. But then here's the thing. Everyone started calling me production assistant. And then they were like, yeah, she's the production assistant. So then I just kept moving in it. You know, I'm just moving in in. Are space. we still in November? I don't remember what month this is. Okay. I should go back and review records. So then records. you went in and you were like, hey, so Harriet. So then I was like, hey, Harriet, I've been operating like the production assistant. I've been a real one. I, I've been a real one. I think I've proven how hardworking that I'm willing to be. I will come on in before anyone. I will leave after everyone, but I'm not making a livable wage and I don't have a backup plan. Mm. And so is there an opportunity to discuss a pay increase? Is there a budget for a production assistant on this team? I think I've proven my, that the value add is worthwhile yeah. for everyone on the team. Like, you know, like I was, I was smooth with it, even though it was ballsy. And somehow I ended up getting a raise for a job I didn't even have. I didn't press my luck after that. Like I never, I just but put my head down. But the decision to not go to work the next day after oh, they offered you twelve dollars. Who gave you that advice? I don't know who that was. I don't know if that was good or evil. But I. But just it wasn't felt, like you didn't call mom and say, "What would you do?" I did talk to my mom after I made the decision, and I said, "Do you think I'm crazy? Like, was that the wrong thing to do? Like, am I out of my mind? Should I call her back and?" say, I'm so sorry, and just come back to work. What did mom say? And mom is a praying woman, and she prayed about it. And she said, no, I think you did the right thing. Good. I think you did the right so thing, So you had sweetheart. peace about it going into I work? I had peace. I mean, I was nervous, but I had peace. And then when I showed up the next day, that's when I was really afraid. I was really like, oh, I've screwed this up. But Harriet batted for you. She did. She really does love you. She saw what you were able to bring to the table, and she said, no, she deserves this. Elaine deserves this. And you got 20 an hour. With so, no OT, with no benefit, she was very clear. She was like, and don't ever do that again. But she did say, <laughs> she, she did, did she, <laughs> yeah, she she scared me. I will tell you, she's like big mama of my career. And she called me in her office and I was like, this is it. This is it, I'm fired. This is a wrap. I'm going back to the waitressing in California. And she invited me to her office and she just like stared me down. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so afraid right now. And then she was like, I want to talk to you about what you did yesterday. Because you weren't even there for... Six months, maybe, maybe six, six months, months. maybe yeah. six months. But we be, we had become very close, right? You know? What you wouldn't advise this to any woman, but Not what this advice exact strategy yet. would you give someone in that position for somebody who feels that they're being undervalued and underpaid and they are consistently over delivering? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, have a network of women or anyone, an ally, any advocates in your life that you can speak to candidly about your circumstances and find people who can help you assess what your actual value is in the marketplace for the work that you're doing. Do your research, like do your homework. Find allies, find a, a mentor and, and use them. Before you go in there yeah. asking for a promotion. Yeah. It's important to balance out really working hard and knowing that you've proven your value before you come in expectantly with a sense of entitlement. Like, mm -hmm. I really think there has to be a, a fine balance. And I know it sounds crazy me saying this after that crazy story I just shared, but Harriet will tell you if she was sitting here that she, she did that because of the work. Mm -hmm. She believed in me and she saw my potential and she saw that I was over delivering. Good. And I think that's important, you know, that it, it's a process. I think that in this age of social media, there is this sense of instant gratification that 
I think a lot of people come into the work world and think that promotions happen overnight. You went from Ebony straight to Glamour. You were at Glamour yeah. first, hot second. Yeah, I was at Glamour for a year. Okay, you were and, at Glamour yeah. for a year. And then you went to Teen Vogue. Yeah. And you were the first black beauty director. Yeah. At Teen Vogue. Yeah, at Condé Nast. Or, yeah. yeah, at Condé Nast for five years. Yeah, I was there. Okay, you tell it. I started my job, my first big job at Teen Vogue was beauty director, and I was 25, and then at 29. But you can't say just beauty director. You were the first black beauty director, correct? I was. First I black was. female beauty director. First black... Yeah, beauty director in Connie Nass history, which is not a role that you sign up for. It's not like I knew I was going to be making history by doing this job. I was just like working really hard. Actually, Eva Chen was the beauty director before me, and she right. sought me out when she was leaving and said, "This, you should take this job," and like kind of like helped throw my name in the ring. And I was like, "No, no I'm not ready. I'm not ready." I was so scared. I had so much imposter syndrome. I was just like, "No, not me, not me." I passed it up. Actually, I passed up the opportunity to even apply. And then because of Eva Chen, another woman looking around for another woman, mm -hmm. I was pushed forward and they're like, no, you're gonna mm -hmm. go out for this job. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up getting that particular job at 25. And then by 29, yeah, I was promoted to editor. Got it, so it wasn't overnight. Editor in chief. That's how it's presented in the headlines. And that's how it seems on the, the highlight reel that we show you on yeah. the internet. And that's why I, it was so important to me to write this book so that I could share a little bit more, a lot more, Yes. Um, of the stuff that gets left out of 100%. the success stories that were told. And that's the stuff that's the most universal stuff, the challenges. Well, that's what I want to talk about because yeah. you, you went from Ebony to Condé and you went from black media to mainstream fashion. That's a big difference. Yeah, it was a culture shock. In some ways, it was familiar territory for me because I was used to being the only black woman in the room growing mm. up. I was like the token black friend. I had become comfortable with that discomfort. But I think what I recognized was just the disparity between the kinds of resources that black media had versus the kinds of resources that a magazine like Glamour had. Mm. And honestly, one of the things that puzzled me was like as a black editor coming from black magazine into a mainstream magazine, I was expected to become an expert or to be an expert on beauty primarily for white women. Oh, and interesting. There wasn't the same expectation of white editors to understand how to speak about beauty as an expert for women of color. Mm -hmm. And so that was interesting for me. I was like, wait a minute, like, hold on. I, I became an expert on self-tanner, something I never will need. I became an expert on like volumizer and you know, I could, I could pick out your foundation shade in a second. That was the job. Wow. But beauty, experts who had been in this industry for 20 plus years could not tell you the difference between like a Yaki braid and a dreadlock or like, you know, they couldn't help you, a, a woman of color, pick out her foundation if you paid them a million dollars. Like, like right. there was just this, there's just this disparity in education about women of color. And, it and now here you are to, having to educate. And now I'm here I am educating and I'm like the newbie on the block. It just reflected that the beauty standard in America. You can say issue. Issue, you know. Problem. Problem. We, we let, should we go there? We yes. Should we go there? Let's go. But, but there is this, it's like skinny, white, woman, cis woman, like mm -hmm. it, straight, that, blonde hair, blue eyes. Like that's the standard of beauty. Mm -hmm. And anything else is presented as a deviation and as secondary, not as important. And so I really felt charged with a mission to change that narrative, especially because I personally knew how damaging that was as a three-year-old, as a little kid, as a little brown girl, looking at, for myself in magazines mm. and never seeing me mm. reflected. So it was important for me to have both of those experiences, to know what it is to celebrate black beauty, center blackness, at a black magazine, work among black people, learn how to be an expert in talking about our issues, yeah. and then bringing that to a mainstream space that to needed celebrate. It. But here's the thing I will say, and this is also part of why I wrote my book: it's not easy to just be the only one mm -mm. who knows about your culture. It's not easy to figure out how to use your voice for good. Right. It is not easy being the sole voice in the room advocating for something that no one has experienced before or sees as necessarily a problem. So it took me time. I would say like the, the entire time I was at Glamour, I think I was 
I was in a little bit of an assimilation syndrome phase where I was just trying to fit in. I saw an opportunity to make things better. I really was still building courage to take my shot at making things better. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. Because we we're like we talk about like finding your voice and using your voice as like like in meme form. And it's just like, it sounds so easy. And everybody talks about like just doing it and being brave. Yeah. But they're not in these rooms where it's everybody who looks the same at the table and then you're the one different one that's trying to convince them that this is like what should we should be talking about. Exactly. And I, you know all about that. I do a little bit. I mean, I can't identify at all being a black woman coming in and talking about, you know, white beauty and what does that look like and then having to change people's minds. Like You don't know that's, what that's like, but you know what it's like to be the only one advocating for a different kind of beauty standard. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. But I think that that must have been a lot of pressure. Was it 2017 you officially became the EIC of Teen Vogue? Yeah, I became editor in Wait, I can't remember why. I think it was years. 2016 you yeah, became yeah, yeah. an editor. Yes. And 2017 editor, you became yeah. the EIC. Yeah, then it's okay. The I have the notes. Don't uh, thank worry. You, sis. It's your yeah, life, but I got you've the done, notes. You've done your homework. You yeah. need to just tell me wh- how it all happened. So then what right. happened then, was... This what had happened. You were the youngest at Condé Ooh. History as the second what? black Word? woman as an EIC. Do you know who the first one was? Yeah, Kia Minor. She was the Kia first... Minor. Yeah, Kia Minor was the first black editor-in-chief in Condé Nast History... She was the editor-in-chief of Brides. So I became the second Black editor-in-chief. It's amazing. I mean, you've had so many milestones, and yet you weren't even 30 yet. Yeah, I was 30 when I became editor-in-chief. I was 29 when I became the editor of the magazine. Was it significant for you walking into this new role, and now you're the leader? Okay, yes and no. There was a gradual transition again. Like, it's not like my whole life changed overnight, necessarily. Mm -hmm. I was at Teen Vogue. I was a part of a shift in the cultural conversation internally for years before that happened. And we were already as a team, hire by hire, story by story, shifting the mission of Teen Vogue Mm -hmm. from the inside. So by the time that I was promoted, I was so ready. I was so already off to the races. The the mission had already been crystallized. We were already running in that direction. And again, it's like about proving your value sometimes before you're actually kind of knighted. There had been so much momentum that we had created as a team that by the time that happened, I got the baton and I was just like, I just kept running, running that race. So I didn't take time to stop and reflect necessarily, but I will say that it was not lost on me how much that appointment meant to the culture. Right. It was impossible to ignore because it was. my Twitter feed and my Girl. my social media was just like blowing up with feedback from young black women, from black women of every age. And from, Hollywood from was going queer, wild as well. Queer, yeah, I mean, yes. queer young people. I mean, the response was so enormous, and that was the surprise to me. I'm like, people, why do people care what we're that I'm like? It was that was a, an adjustment. And you were so young. What did and that, I was young, and what but did it, it feel it, like? It was it, such a big impact. It just felt like I had a tribe of support mm. that I I needed, honestly. It wasn't an easy job to step into. It it wasn't an easy time to do that job. But yeah. did you feel like it was hard for you to show up authentically as yourself? Not at that point. That was my job. Like, that was my unique contribution and value add. And I knew that I was there to represent for the community, the many communities Mm -hmm. that had not ever had someone in that seat to reflect Mm -hmm. them before. It really clarified my mission, owning everything that made me different, owning that opportunity to amplify voices who have not been centered. That energized me. The big kind of shift for me happened when I became the first black beauty director in Kanye Nats history. When I saw that, yeah, that was when I was 25 and I was like, whoa, why is my race making headlines mm. in 2012? Mm. And that is really when I recognize anyone who tells you we are in a post-racial America does not no. see the world clearly. Right. We have so much more work to do to get to a place of equality. Yeah. I had a lot of mixed feelings about that a, a celebration around that first, because in one regard, of course, like this is a big deal, a pretty big deal. Yes. But if we are still celebrating first, in 2012 and 16, 17, then that means we have a lot more work to do. Yeah. And we can't forget that in the midst of the celebrating. We have to recognize that's actually just shining a light on how much more progress we have yet to make. You changed the whole narrative of the publication's voice 
And it didn't happen overnight, like you said. And I think that people look at something like that you did or even my career. It's like, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. Mm. But four years ago, being on the cover of Sports Illustrated, people are like, oh, she just is overnight sensation. Right. But they don't understand the real work that went behind it. Yeah. It's a very pivotal point that you make in that there's so much work that had already been done. Do you feel like today that work has continued? 100%. That's good. 1,000%. Not only at Teen Vogue, which they continue to do excellent work, the journalism that, that is coming out of Teen Vogue, I'm so incredibly proud of, but I saw a shift in media. I've seen this progression continue and, and, oh, yeah. and you're a big part of that. I mean, I'm not the only, there are many people who so are part of pushing, happen, yeah. yeah, pushing against the status quo and creating a new normal and a new beauty standard and a new kind of conversation around diversity and inclusion. And hopefully when your beautiful baby is like your age and able to sit here and have a conversation, they're not going to be talking about diversity and inclusion. It's yeah. going to be such a snore because we are already living in a world where that's reflected. That's a, the norm, right? You know, and I, yeah. I think that our generation, part of our job is to make that so. I love this quote in your book more than enough. It's Vogue's rebellious little sister had started a fire that couldn't be stopped. Mm. Ooh, it's so sexy. She wrote that? And also like, <laughs> <laughs> what were some of your biggest wins at Conde? I don't think any of my wins were solo wins. They were all mm. team efforts. One of the things that made me really, really proud was the final print issue of Teen Vogue. Having the opportunity to do an issue of Teen Vogue guest edited by Hillary Clinton. And then being able to bring that to life with the first Teen Vogue Summit, where we mm. brought together young people from across the country, from across the world, to meet women like Hillary Clinton, but to put them in conversation with folks like Yara Shahidi and to have this kind of intergenerational conversation around all of these issues that matter so much to the next generation and to be able to foster a sense of community. Mm -hmm. Like, I think there was, there was this whole community that had been galvanized online around the work that Teen Vogue was doing in terms of, you know, the political coverage and social justice coverage in tandem with fashion and beauty and celebrity mm -hmm. news. But this was the first time that we could actually get those young people off their phones, off the internet and like bring them together in real life mm -hmm. to really build meaningful connections with each other. And to this day, I get DM'd, I see girls on the street, I, I meet girls at my book signings and they're like, I went to that Teen Vogue Summit and I met my first boss and I have been working in this industry or I went there and I met this girl who then became my roommate after college and I literally could not have survived my move to New York City or to whatever big city, LA, without this person. And right. it all happened because of this thing that you guys created. And so for me, that, that it was like, that was the pinnacle. I felt like I left on a high. I, I, I did what I came to do. I was do. just about to say, like, yeah, did my you mission feel, was accomplished, I felt. Did you feel any sense of doubt leaving? No, because by the time I got to that place, I was so clear that mm. it was, it was, the right decision and no regrets. not a single regret, not a single second of looking back. But it took a lot of work to get there for sure. It took months and months of like really planning and praying and figuring it out and, and talking to my advisory board and sitting with my, my at the time, like Ava DuVernay was someone who I just, I she was my kind of fairy godmother mentor in that moment. And she, I just remember she looked at me and she was just like, I think the universe is calling you to be a little bit braver right now. What did you and say? I, was, I like died. I, I, you were in her apartment? Yeah, we, we, we were able to have a moment. I met her at the Team Vogue Summit on stage. Afterwards, we connected and we had that kind of career shifting, life changing conversation for me. That advice is something that has never left me. And it's one of those things like once you hear that, you can't unhear it. Mm -hmm. You know, that moment changed me. And after that, it just became so clear. It was like, oh, the decision has already been made. Now I just need to walk into it. I just need to like actualize this. Be a and little braver. Be a little bit braver. And there was so much ahead of me that only I could see. And that's what's scary. I think it's scary when like you have a dream and you have a vision, but you're sort of isolated yes. in seeing You talk it. about this in the book. Because people say, oh, you're so brave to like have left this big job when you were this age. And how did you know, how'd you do that yet? How'd you have the courage to do that? And I'm like, no, nah. when you know it's time to move, 
it is scarier to stand still than it is to just walk into your purpose and to just do the thing that you need to do. You know, even if it's scary, what's scarier is stalling, getting stuck, getting in a place where you can't grow, you're not growing anymore. Like, that's the worst thing ever. I hope these kids are listening. Do you feel that though too? A hundred percent. That's any aspect of life. That's, that's work, a relationship. Those relationship, bad relationships all where you're not it, growing anymore. All of it. All through your book, you give incredible advice like mm. this. And the full title of your book is More Than Enough, Claiming Space for Who You Are No Matter What They Say. Oh, I like the way you say Ooh. it. And it's not a memoir. It's a manifesto. Hey! <laughs> The book was amazing. The press mm. you're doing around is amazing. The, Thank I mean, you. what the way that you see young girls just so excited to read the book on your social media. You guys have actually started your own social media page more than enough. Yeah. What are you planning to do with it now? I am going to be building on that community that we saw come together around the book. I did a 10 city tour and then I got the opportunity to go to the UK and to Canada. And there was just such a need for young women of color and just young women who are climbing the career ladder, looking for support, advice, a community. And so we'll be building on that community and there's more to come next year around the paperback launch in, in springtime. But, oh, great. Um, but yeah, it's more been the enough. most rewarding thing of my entire life. And you must know what I mean because you wrote a book too and it was pretty incredible. Did you feel that way about putting that out into the world? I did. did I was just glad that I could get the whole story out up until that point because I had released my book when I was 30. And mm -hmm. it was just, it was just nice like to be like, you could call it a memoir. I didn't mind the word mm -hmm. memoir because I just felt like, oh, memoir at 30, yeah, and watch what else I do. Yes, <laughs> I love that. So I don't get twisted with the words. It's more so like, just wait and see what else I do. I love that. But I think that there's really something about having your book, having your story out there and being able to help young girls who are in very similar situations as you. And that's yeah. why I, I got, you know, deep about sex, food, yeah. relationships, religion, yeah. all of family. Like, I, I think it's important just as you did. What does the phrase, and you've answered this a million times, but what does the phrase more than enough mean to you? It means that no matter what the voice in your head is saying and no matter what um, you've heard that makes you believe that you're not good enough or not smart enough, not successful enough, skinny enough, all the things that we are told and that we tell ourselves. It is a counter narrative that pushes back against all of that and claims space for the truth, which is that we are more than enough. Even if we are a work in progress, mm. it is necessary as we move through our lives and carve out lanes that have not been carved out before for us to be able to remind ourselves that we have everything that we need to do the work that we're meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, Project Runway season two. Yeah, I'm so excited. Yes. Yeah, it's going to be even better. Like the last oh, one really? was so even good. Better? Yeah. I came to the premiere. Like oh, yeah. well, the little one that we had at Soho House. It yeah, was really, yeah, yeah. It was awesome. The intimate one. Yes. Yeah. Family and friends. Yes. VIP. Mm -hmm. So what can we expect season two? It's just even better. I mean, the first one was so good and I have a terrible memory. So I watched it as a true fan and, and like I couldn't remember who we voted off and stuff. I was like, what happens next? Like, oh my God. The suspense was so good in the first one. But this one, I think we've all kind of settled into our roles and we've all kind of found our individual lanes and the talent is on another level. Good. So the bar is just higher. Okay. And you can expect to see like real fashion and you can also expect to see some some real interesting personalities. That's all I will say. Okay. And and some tears. It's a good one. It's a really I good one. I do love Christian Seriano. He's I love Christian so near much in this role. I know. He's so and sweet. And Carly, like, Oh, just serving looks. BFF. Just, yeah, love I Carly. love her. She's such a good person. I know. Okay, you talk a little bit about Jonathan in the book, but I now you've got a ring on it. your finger. Yeah, actually, I have. I'm like, I feel like I'm in the Guinness World Records for the longest engagement. I. I How we, long is your engagement? We've been? been engaged for like three years, and we'll be engaged for like four years by the time we get married. But when are you getting married? Have you set a date? We did set a date. <gasps> yeah, we set a date. It's happening. 2020. It's oh finally gosh. happening. I feel like I needed to like push out this book baby first before I, get I could think about, before I could create the space yeah. to to like think about a wedding and all that stuff. But I am such a huge proponent of taking your time. Like you hopefully will only do it once. So I know when we got engaged, it was a beautiful 
moment and like tra a transition for sure in our relationship, but I wasn't ready to get married. Mm -hmm. And he waited for me and he oh. took, he was patient. And it's like, to me, the putting a ring on it is just the beginning of a long process. And we wanted to like do, I was excited about doing premarital counseling. I was like, I was like, Ooh. I'm not excited about planning a wedding, but get me into premarital counseling. Let us, let us talk about all the things. And it's been awesome. What has been your biggest difference in premarital counseling? Like that oh. you didn't know, that you weren't ready for? Ooh, that's a good juicy question. I like to think about that. Um, I think, well, Jonathan and I have such st strong communication so nothing blew, like there was no like big bombs, you know, or yeah. like no, no, no crazy secrets or nothing that's a good sign. Good sign. Nothing surprised me to the core, but I think uh, just identifying ways that maybe men actually need a little bit more help um, identifying what they need. Ah. Uh. You know, so I it's feel not like the communicating. It's it's, it's just identifying more so saying what it is. I think it's for I think for women like we have girlfriends who are like our therapists our whole life. We talk about everything. We like wear our heart on our open sleeves. Books. Open books. Then what happened next, girl? Well, how did you feel about that? We ask each other these questions that prompt self reflection. And guys just often don't have that network and that skill set so and so they need to do the work of like identifying what they even need in order to even figure out how to communicate it and and that has been something that i've been like oh part of my job as a wife will be like really helping to identify his needs and then trying to address his needs and like serve him in, in a way that he can hear you in a way yeah and love languages okay that's the thing read that book oh. the five love languages we read it on our honeymoon and i swear it's like a game changer five love languages what's your love language i am um acts of service like hands down you are like i'll come home and like i didn't make the bed but you got to make the bed Wow, wow we're gonna get it. some tonight, Ooh. honey. Yes, and, he, and he's what is he? He is time spent and physical touch, mm -hmm. and not that I don't need those things. It's just not at the top of my list. Yeah, yeah, I feel that completely. I'm, I'm words of affirmation. Okay, so I will tell you. Yes, how much I love you. <laughs> you know, what I mean, I will tell you how beautiful you are. He's like, yeah, but, but you haven't. Clean the dishes or da da da. I'm like, oh, he's yeah. acts of service too. He, I think he really appreciates. That's an okay. Act you can figure it out. I'm gonna figure it out. You're gonna figure I'm it committed. out. I'm committed. I'm committed to. Thank you, Elaine. Thank well, you, to Ross. Ashley Graham. You're so sweet for being here. Are you I really kidding? Appreciate you're it. sweet for having me on. This oh. is so awesome. I'm really happy for everything you're doing, and it's just it's inspiring. It's meaningful. We need more women like you who are just being open and honest with their stories mm. for the younger generation. So thank, thank you. you. Sis. The same back to you. Well, thank you. I can you. say the same to you. One last thing. At the end of every interview, mm. we do a little lightning round. Pretty big deal. So easy questions. Okay. Hopefully. Let's do this. Dun, 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 dun. What's the last pretty penny you spent? Pretty penny on this, on this hair? I went to a wedding last night and I and I I had a hairstylist come. I was real bougie. I had a hairstylist come. And this is just like my curly hair. So they just like rejudged my curly hair. So. Okay. But hey, hair is always that's always it's, good it's money. It's a good spent. investment. Hello. You know? Okay, so what's your biggest relationship but what does deal that mean? breaker? Like I'm going to break up with you if yes, you do this. Yes, because you got bad breath. I don't know. Oh, we don't do bad breath. Yeah. <laughs> we actually talked about that today. Like what's a non-negotiable? Like, like bad breath is a non-negotiable. I will say on a on a light note. If I, you're not funny, you're not getting anywhere near me. Oh my god, I feel as... that. I laugh every day to the point where I'm crying in tears Aww. with Jonathan, and I feel like that is a new necessary. Yeah, it um, is. Don't do bad breath. That's not my thing either. And also, I'm just gonna say it like cheating. Some women have the capacity to deal with that, and I will no judgment zone. I am not one of those women. That's all I'll say. I like that answer. Zero tolerance policy. Okay, finally, you're a pretty big deal, but I want to know what's a pretty big deal to you. What does that mean? A pretty big deal. Like, pretty big deal like to me is people being nice. That's a pretty uh, big deal. Aw. Uh, pretty big deal to me. You know what? Random acts of kindness. It really blows my mind when people are just nice. For no reason. For no reason and in big ways. Like, one example was just the other day I was at the airport in Canada and I was in a big rush and I was in line buying food, overpriced food, and I was hungry. So I got pizza, a charcuterie board, and like a water, and it came up to $52. And while I was like grumbling about, I was like, this is highway robbery. This is so expensive. I go to swipe my card and it gets 
decline. And by the way, I made a big deal about the fact that my plane's about to leave, so they had already put the pizza in the oven. And I was like, um, shame phase. It was a false fraud alert. So I'm standing there and this guy in line puts his card out and says, no worries. <gasps> he goes, you can hit me back on PayPal. Oh. And I'm, like, I'm like, you don't even know me. You're gonna pay $51. It wasn't like it was like five bucks. It was $51. And he was like, no worries. He That's like, so nice. He's like, hit me back. And I was like, oh my, I was, I was almost moved to tears. I was speechless. I wanted to hug him. Okay. I was like, it Thank really- Thank you, friend. Yeah, random acts of kindness. And it honestly, it's a pretty it made deal. me want to look for opportunities to do that for somebody else. That's amazing. Maybe not $51 pizza, but you know. Hey, you never know. Elaine, thank you so much. Thank you. This so was such much, an awesome Ashley. conversation. And I want to also thank all of you for watching. Make sure you go to all the socials on Pretty Big Deal, Instagram and Twitter. And please let us know. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments. You know, Elaine and I are very active on social media. We so are, we'll be we're, talking we're gonna back be scrolling. <laughs> Feel free to throw in a little some compliments, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, on, on, on hair. She spent enough money on her hair. Thank you for watching. Bye.